Is that? No, but it won't go back now. Bear with me, everyone. Please. I don't, I don't know. It seems like there's a tight spot here. Maybe I just have to use the other one. I don't know. Yeah, but it won't, it won't uh, because then I'm in a blank spot where it won't. Much better off 12,000 years ago. <laughs> oh, I'm pressing the wrong one. Oh, okay. Okay, so now if the mic will work. Okay, they tell me it's not going to work. So we're going we're going to have to. Okay, sorry about that. We're going to have to stick with this. Can you hear me from here? I may just have to do it from here. If I want to point out something, I'll just walk over and then walk back and not have a mic. But maybe I'll just have to do it this way. This sounds better, doesn't it? I can hear that. Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit done. Okay, so let me get into it, and I know that they won't hold that technical aspect against my time limit. <laughs> okay, I want to talk today, I want to focus on Gebekli Tepe, which is a really important site. Some of those, I see you out there, you've been there with me, which is really wonderful. And Gebekli Tepe really is an incredibly important site. It ties in with the work that I've been doing for over two decades now, and it really is a paradigm shattering site. And it goes back about 12,000 years, and just to put it in context of what Walter was just Speaking of, he spoke of the Yuga cycle and processional cycle. If you think of the great year, this, I just want to point this out now, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. This is about a half, half cycle back. So back into a very different period. Some people would say in a golden age, half a processional cycle back approximately. And it is paradigm sh uh, shattering because there is this paradigm. I am trained as a classical academic. I got my PhD in geology and geophysics at Yale. I had a paradigm, a worldview, which we could summarize a little bit like this, that it's primitive old, you know, people coming from the well, ape-type forms, slowly, gradually rising, sort of the rise and progress until we get up to smart, intelligent, sophisticated, technological us. And of course, this ties in with the 19th century concept of evolution and one, but Darwinian evolution uh, in particular, and the concept of social progress, technological progress. And you really have to wonder whether this is absolutely true. But, you know, standard textbook, classic, yes, this is the way it is. And when it comes to the rise of civilization, one of the people that really solidified this concept of how we have the origin of civilization and the rise of sort of evolutionary progression toward what we call civilization was a man named B. Gordon Child. And he really developed, put all the pieces together and came up with a paradigm that now is taught and is accepted by many archeologists, many classical, conventional academics, historians, prehistorians to this moment. And it goes something like this, that the fundamental stages of humanity leading up to civilization are first those horrible savages. So we are in a savage stage, hunters, gatherers, they forage for their food, they sort of scrounge around, can't really accomplish much of anything other than a bare, meager existence. Then you have the barbarians, and barbarians is a technical term here because the barbarians have figured out how to do a little bit of cultivation, a little bit of agriculture, they're still foraging, they're still hunting and gathering. They might start to build up a few village settlements, and then ultimately this leads to what Child defined as genuine civilization, where you have high culture, monumental ar architecture, keep that in mind, sophisticated technology, you have writing, you have literacy, you have symbolic notation, and you have cities. That's where the term comes from in part. 
And this last stage, according to the conventional thinking, is reached about 3500 BCE, so a bit over 5,000, 5 to 6,000 years ago, in primarily Mesopotamia, in what is now known as modern, and was known in classical ancient times, Mesopotamia. And you can, you know, this is the standard view. For instance, Katie, my wife, um, Catherine Ulysses, Katie, and I just, I couldn't make this up. We go to the Smithsonian Institution a couple of years ago, and here they illustrate the basic standard paradigm. You know, we start out primitive old them, we get up, I don't know what, uh, they're burial, this is a burial. And then, you know, we slowly rise through the thousands of years here, some cave painting, et cetera, et cetera. But I would contend, and you've already heard a sense of this, that this is the modern story. This is the modern paradigm of the last couple of hundred years at most. Before that, there was a reverence for the ancients, and not just a reverence for the ancients, but people who were ancient to us now, like the great Plato, they believed absolutely that there were earlier civilizations, even more advanced than their Greek civilization, for instance. The Egyptians had the same concept, the dynastic Egyptians, that there was something more advanced, something earlier. I want to point out with Plato, everyone knows, he told the story of Atlantis. He recounted the story of Atlantis. Couple of side comments, many things to keep in mind as I'm talking. But for instance, if you look at Plato's literal interpretation, we put it into modern, our modern chronology, when is Atlantis? About 9600 BCE. Keep that in mind. Um, this matches the geological record of the end of the last ice age. This is, to make a long story short, Gebekli Tepe time. I'm not saying Atlantis is Gebekli Tepe, but the concept of civilization at that remote period. Also, this is a reconstruction, one of many reconstructions to Plato, as he described it, notice the ring type circular structure. Just keep that in mind. We will see that again. Again, I just want to point out a few similarities among many. And I would say that in many ways, in modern terms, the standard paradigm began to crack in 1990. 1990, I'm not trying to point to myself too much, but Walter mentioned it. 1990 <laughs> <laughs> is when I first went to Egypt to look at the Sphinx from a geological point of view, applying you know, what I know in terms of geology and geophysics. And at that time, Honestly, I was a good academic. I'm still a good academic, but I, I agreed with the status quo. I agreed with child. That's what I learned. I mean, how could this guy be wrong? All the evidence supposedly pointed to it, but of course, active in what evidence they look at sometimes. Yes. And I've come to realize even in science, you can actually learn new things. <laughs> um, so, more. But Again, the paradigm at the time was that the rise of civilization is about 3500 BC, the carving of the Sphinx, all the Egyptologists assured me because to paraphrase, they had studied this, thousands of Egyptologists had studied this for hundreds of years, and they knew, which was turned out to be a great exaggeration, they knew that the Sphinx was carved about 2500 BC. And I start to look at that. Here's just a pretty picture of the Sphinx. The Sphinx sits on the Giza Plateau near the edge of Cairo on the eastern edge of the Sahara. It is desert. It's carved from the limestone bedrock. And notice, too, in these pictures, can you see the Sphinx enclosure wall behind? Yeah. The Sphinx is carved down into the bedrock, which is a recarving. It's a dynastic had originally stood above the plateau geologically. They had to carve down to carve out the Sphinx. This is not the Sphinx. This is the Sphinx enclosure. This is one of the walls of the Sphinx enclosure. That's myself in my younger years with John Anthony West. Some people know him or certainly heard of him. He got me involved in all this initially. And I studied it Bottom line, I'm not going to go into Sphinx heavily today, but just to give you background, the core body 
the enclosure walls show evidence of water erosion. This is incomplete.